thanks for coming everyone. This is the Media Communication Society's first event of the year. I'm delighted to have John Penn here as guest speaker. So he is a Photoshop engineer, works for Adobe in Silicon Valley. I'm delighted to enjoy. speaking in front of a bigger crowd than I was expecting, to be honest. Um, uh, so basically, I, I got asked to talk about a little bit about what I do and how I got there and, uh, and the like. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. So it'll be, it may be a little bit rambly, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so my name is John Penn, or John Penn II, depending on which version of Photoshop you look at the splash screen on. Um, I am. Uh, uh, I've been at Adobe for, for a long time, 15 years now. This is a long time in Silicon Valley. Most people change jobs uh, much, more, much more frequently than that. And uh, I have a, an unusual job at the company, and I, I'll talk about basically how I, how I got there. Uh, but let's start sort of from the beginning. So how did I get into computers in general? Um, so I'm, I'm a lifelong nerd, basically. Started out really, really young, uh, uh, 11 or so years old. I got my first computer. Uh, and back in those days, you didn't have uh, software. You could go out and buy software. You got a computer, and it just came empty, and then you could write software on it. And so I started writing software with an Apple II. Um, and really got interested in it, really, really kind of enjoyed it, had a great time with it, and decided that, uh, that this was something that was going to be a sort of a fun job to do for a while. Uh, basically, just went up into my room and just started writing software. Um, picked up manuals, taught myself as much as I could teach myself, and, uh, and, and took it from there. Uh, that took me through high school. Um, actually, in high school, so the school system here, I had a discussion about it last night, is, is a little bit different, right? So we have uh, <coughs> elementary school, middle school, and high school, and then you go off to college. Um, so high school is you know your last four years, starting at about the age of 13, 12, 13 years old, basically, and going until you're 17 or 18 years old. Um, so uh, I spent a lot of that time essentially uh, in the library, where the only computer we had in the school was, and uh, and working on that very much, and then, and then going away uh, until um, a movie called War Games came out. Anybody familiar with the, the game, the movie War Games? <laughs> okay, so everybody, if you're, here's your assignment for the summer or whatever. Watch that movie. It's Matthew Broderick. Um, it's a uh, it's a it's an old movie, but I think it's an interesting one. There's a remake of it. Ignore the remake. Just go back to the old Matthew Broderick version. Uh, so that movie basically described you know a young kid who breaks into. Uh, uh, U.S. Missile Command and all sorts of things go wrong and hilarity ensues because they we almost get to the brink of a nuclear war, the, the usual type thing. But when that movie came out, one, there are a bunch of scenes in that movie that were kind of pivotal. Um, the kid who was a hacker at the time uh, uh, basically was able to change his grades at school. Uh, and there are a couple other things along those lines that, that caught young people's attention in, in my era, in my class. And so this was the first first time that everybody thought of me as a kid that was sitting off the computer in the corner using a computer. And then the movie came out, and suddenly I was the, the kid who could change their grades. <laughs> it wasn't true, but that's what everybody assumed, right? Because he's sitting at the computer, therefore he must be able to do this stuff. Um, anyway, uh, so that was that was sort of the beginning. From there, I uh, basically started a company when I was in my sophomore year in high school. So. 14 or 15 years old, um, doing cons uh, computer consulting. Uh, there's a city in uh, Crystal, in, uh, in Virginia, right in the Pentagon, actually, where uh, uh, that city was being built when I was in high school, and a lot of the buildings that are there are built using some engineering software that I wrote for them when I was in, in high school. Uh, after high school, I decided that what I really wanted to do was be a DJ. Um, <laughs> Because I figured I could get paid for that. I had no idea I could really get seriously paid doing computer work. 
Um, I didn't get much out of the DJ thing except uh, my wife, which is really <laughs> So, um, for some reason, it's not easier for DJs than computer guys to be women, at least at the time. <laughs> maybe it's changed, maybe it's improved. Um, uh, I guess, actually, uh oh. <laughs> So, uh, uh, interesting time. Uh, after about a year or two of doing the, the DJ thing, I discovered that this isn't going to pay enough to actually support you know, having a girlfriend. And so uh, I went back into the computer industry and, and basically started uh, consulting to uh, the uh, military in the Pentagon. And the thing that is interesting to, to note there is that I, I didn't go to college. So, um, I, you know, I went, I'm self-taught, I didn't take any computer classes in school, and I didn't go to college. And that first job that I had working at the, um, or consulting to the military, that cost me. So while I was doing similar work uh, to everybody who was working with me, I didn't, uh, I didn't get paid anywhere nearly the same amount. My job was classified as a different kind of job. I, got, I basically got hired as a data entry guy. So somebody who just sits there and types data into a computer. And not as a uh, not as an engineer, and that's all because I didn't have any college experience uh, or, or college time. And I'll say, you know, again, this is back in the '80s, so a, a very different time to today. Um, and it's much, much, much more difficult to uh, break into industry without that college time. Uh, so I highly recommend that people take the route that you guys are taking, just to get get that schooling. Um, the other thing that I recommend is experience, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, from there, I moved to San Diego, uh, and San Diego for me was a really um, interesting experience uh, on a number of fronts, and it builds into sort of where we're, we're getting uh, going today. So, the two things that happened, three things that happened in San Diego that were kind of uh, pivotal. I was uh, asked to come out there, uh, I literally moved from one side of the country to the other overnight. They uh, asked if I would come out and help them with a particular project. And I said, sure, you know, I'd come out and interview, and they basically hired me uh, overnight, and I had all of my belongings FedExed from my parents' house uh, to California, San Diego. Uh, San Diego is a beautiful city. It has no weather, unlike here. Um, it, uh, I, in fact, I have no idea. The first thing that amazed me when I moved there is why on earth do you even have a weather person? All he does is talk about how big the waves are going to be for that person to stay there. He doesn't talk about, it's always sunny, it's going to be cloudy in the morning, sunny in the afternoon, 70 degrees, okay. Whatever. Um, but two interesting things sort of happened. So I had my first run in with reality. And this is not necessarily computer or, me or media related, but this is a sort of Personal, really. So, when I moved to San Diego, uh, I, as I said, I moved overnight. I had no idea. I, basically, my first time living anywhere away from my parents' house. I was 22 years old, I guess. And I moved into a found a place, a nice little apartment up on a hill in San Diego. And things were perfectly fine until I went to do my laundry one day. And the, the complex that I lived in, we had. Um, uh, laundry, it was in a separate building from the actual apartments that we lived in. So I go out, I do my laundry, I'm sitting there reading a book, and uh, a couple of police officers come up to me with their hands on their weapons, and they want to know who I am and why I'm here. And I'm, you know, I live here, I'm doing my laundry. Of course, I'm doing my laundry, I don't have ID on me. And so, uh, so I went back, I convinced them to let me go back to my uh, apartment, give them some ID. Uh, and explained to them what was going on. So they explained to me what was going on, and it turned out that we had a serial killer in our neighborhood. <laughs> no figure. Um, so uh, it was um, it was an interesting experience, and in that from that point on. So basically, right before I moved there, he had, this person had killed two women, and on the third person he killed, they saw him running away, and he was a young black male, and therefore that fits the description. And so every day on the way to and from work, I basically wound up laying on the hoods of police cars. <laughs> being asked why I was in the area, all that sort of stuff. Uh, as you know, my name is John Penn. Does it help that in San Diego there was a, a family with the last name Penn, 
that had a uh, uh, reputation for killing people. <laughs> 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 so that could go up to my favorite item. I know, right? Throw, throw me into the deep end, right? <laughs> um, now, uh, that went on for a little while, and uh, eventually they put a picture, there was a sketch that was put up in a, in a newspaper in San Diego, uh, which my co-workers at the Navy decided it would be great to blow up and put up on the wall in some place. Um, and eventually that, that whole thing quieted down. He, he did continue to kill people, and killed seven people in total before they caught him. Uh, and then they caught him in another state, and that's a whole, whole sort of different story. Uh, but it was, a, it was a real trial. Right, in terms of uh, how to work through that particular life challenge. Uh, you know, I grew up, uh, I have not mentioned yet that my, my father was a federal judge in Washington, D.C. So I grew up in a, in a household uh, where education was, was critical, important, um, where you know, I've met most of the presidents, uh, except for the last two or three, uh, because they were, were just part of the situation growing up, essentially. Um, Supreme Court justices, you know, things along those lines. So, very different lifestyle from being, you know, part of the government on the one hand, and then being a subject of investigation on the, on the other side, and ultimately it got to the point where I was scared enough for my safety going to and from work, that I called in a favor for my dad and said, hey, can you, can you help me with this situation? And so, you know, he, he made some calls and, and things quieted down. They didn't quite stop, but they, they definitely quieted, quieted down a little bit. Um, the other thing that happened when I was in San Diego was an engineering thing. And the, uh, this is kind of, this is sort of the start of one of the critical, uh, I think, bits of my long career story, which is up until the project in San Diego, I never really thought about the ramifications of the technologies that I created or invented or wrote. So, uh, writing software, for me, was always just an exercise in writing software. You, know, you create something, you put it out there, it's good, it's bad, people like it, people use it, whatever. Um, I had actually had one, one other, I talked about that building in, in, um, in DC with the engineering software that I had written. The way that that went down, it was that there was a team of people maybe 11 or 12 people who worked at this office who would process these reports by hand. Uh, and we designed this piece of software. And then one day I came in from school and uh, there was only one person in the office and where is everybody else? My software had replaced the other 11 people. So that's, yeah, right? So as a kid in high school, this is a pretty big thing to kind of run into, right? Um, and it, it occurred to me at that point that, you know, okay, things that you do sort of make a difference, but I, it didn't really sink in until San Diego. In San Diego, the project that I worked on was a mistake that a piece of software made that related the, that resulted in the deaths of uh, a few hundred people. And I can't say what, what that particular event was, but, but uh, it was uh, essentially a software mistake. Right? It came down to um, the way some things were drawn in a piece of software and, what, and, and how people interpreted what was happening in the world based on what they were seeing in that software. Uh, along with that project, there were a couple of other projects that some of my coworkers were working on. Uh, there was a medical device, and in this medical device, uh, basically what it did is it, uh, it provided uh, radiation therapy to people who, were, who had uh, tumors. And the way that this thing worked is you take a needle and then you stick the needle into the patient, and then a radioactive probe goes down into the needle and uh, provides radiation to the tumor in an isolated area for some dedicated, uh, determined, predetermined period of time, and then takes the, uh, the dose out of the patient. And that way you, you only radiate a small particular area, you keep it confined to the tumor, and everything goes well. Hopefully. So uh, when this software was designed, you know, back in the day, uh, computers were, were much, much slower than they are today. And when you would do things like um, hit the uh, return key on a keyboard, it might be a while before things would refresh. Keyboards have a keyboard buffer in them. So you could hit the return key a couple times, and those returns would be stored there, and then the computer would eventually catch up, eating away at each one of those returns as you, as you wait. So when this software was originally designed, the, the, what would happen is you would get a screen asking for patient information, a screen asking for something else, a screen asking for a dosage. 
the default value that they put when they were originally with that software was the maximum dose the machine could give, which was not a humanly survivable dose. So if you hit the return key too many times, right, it gets caught up in the buffer, and then you kill your patient. That's what happened. <clears throat> so uh, this is a second sort of eye-opening event for me about you know, the ramifications of software, what it can do. Um, now we have to think about the things that we're, we're working on. So, uh, so fast forward a little bit. Um, the next couple of, co of places that I worked were um, Prodigy, which is an internet company in the, in the States, uh, Apple. I worked there for all of a year before Steve Jobs came back and uh, fired my entire side of the company. Um, literally, that's the way Steve works, trust me. Um, and then, uh, and that landed me at Adobe. And the way that uh, I looked at the, the Adobe thing was, you know, I came home from work one day, I looked around my, my den and looked at all the software I had on the shelves and was like, which companies would I want to work for? What, what would I want to do? And Adobe was up there, Photoshop was up there, and so um, that's who I applied to. Um, by now, I had a reputation, I had a lot of experience, and, um, you know, that many years into my career, people didn't really pay much attention to the fact that college was not uh, on, my on my resume as much back then again. Um, so, funny story about applying to Adobe. So, when I applied to Adobe, uh, I sent in a beautiful resume. You know, I'm sure you've all gone through some kind of a resume process, right? Where you practice writing them up and you've got them formed and the whole deal and what do they look like and how much text should you put there? And so I sent this resume into, into the system uh, by fax, and um, I got back a letter about a week later saying, thank you for submitting your resume to Adobe, however, we couldn't read uh, your resume because it was in the wrong font. <laughs> wrong font? Yeah, that's a weird thing. So I sent it in again, this time via mail, and I got back exactly the same message, the wrong font. Um, so I guess they had some OCR system that was not was having trouble reading the text in my resume for some reason. So I, in sort of frustration and you know whatever, I copied the text out of my resume out of Word, which is what I think I was using at the time, pasted it completely unformatted into an email, and sent it into the like jobs at adobe.com email address, and got a call for an interview a couple of days later. Okay, <laughs> this is a good start. <laughs> so. Um, so that's basically what brought me, uh, or how I got to the company. So I've always worked uh, on Photoshop. So Photoshop was the first team that I got hired to. Um, it is uh, where I um, uh, basically have spent most of my time. Um, if you've used uh, any of the versions of software, say before six, uh, you know you've seen my name up on the front there. <laughs> there we are. We're fine down. Um, <laughs> so Thomas Knoll here, uh, he's the guy who invented Photoshop. So he and his brother invented the software back in 1990, excuse me, 1989, and tried to shop it around to a company. Um, nobody was interested. Nobody could see a purpose for a piece of software like Photoshop, uh, believe it or not. Now at the time, no digital cameras. Scanners were like $15,000 a pop. And, um, you know, so it essentially was a complicated drawing program at that point in time. Um, the, because of that, Adobe had some foresight and thought that it would be an interesting product to have, but not enough foresight to buy it out right from the brothers. Um, his brother, by the way, is John Will. If you watched, and if you've seen any of the Star Wars movies, uh, particularly the, the ones that most people don't claim are actually Star Wars movies, so. What's that? One episode one, two, and three. Uh, his name is the name and uh, the biggest name in the credits. Uh, so he does. He works at ILM. He does all the special effects there. Part of the reason they originally wrote Photoshop was for a movie called uh, The Abyss, uh, which you may or may not remember. Really good water effects. Who has seen The Abyss? Okay. Good. At least a few of you. It's a good movie to see. <laughs> I remember it as being good, but really interesting effects for the time. Um, anyway, uh, who else is there? So Sifa is the other name that most people pay attention to. 
Yeah, that's a hard one to think. <laughs> this long name right here <laughs> um, is, uh, he's been on the team uh, probably the longest at this point. Um, so Photoshop was originally written on the Mac, and uh, Sita and Mark, uh, excuse me, Mark Hammer, who's uh, to his left there, uh, converted all of Photoshop to Windows um, themselves, essentially. And now Photoshop is a big, big program. Um, it's in the tens of millions of lines of code area, so a massively large piece of software. There are about 20 people on the engineering team that, that write it. There are um, probably about 40 people who are, uh, maybe double that number, who are basically doing testing. So we have more testing than we do engineers because we want the, so the software to be as solid as possible. Um, most of the people who are doing testing are basically artists, uh, multimedia people, um, people who have artistic skills. So there's engineering, I like to judge that there's engineering art, which is basically smiley faces. Uh, and then there are, there's testing art, and testers are absolutely amazing. Most of the time, the splash screens that you see, um, well, back in the day, actually come from the testers. Um, nowadays, you know, corporate pretty much drives the look and feel of all of our applications. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the team. So, uh, as you know, that's me, uh, Photoshop guy. Been at this for about 35 years, working at Adobe. So this is my hallway. Uh, back in the day, anybody recognize this? This is a lot of people. And anybody recognize this? This is a boxed piece of software. No, no. We don't do that anymore either. Um, this is our, our main tower downtown. Um, so software. This is the main tower. So I work uh, essentially underneath that FedEx jet on the other side of the building. We have uh, three towers downtown. We're an international company, so we have offices all over the world, essentially. Um, it's a fun environment, as it says there on the, on the left. Uh, if I were to show up to work wearing what I'm wearing right now, uh, people would ask me if I'd been to a wedding or a funeral. Um, generally, it's uh, shorts, t-shirts, shoes are optional. Uh, it's a pretty laid-back kind of place. I mean, you've been there, so it's, it's, it's a neat place. Um, the hallways are, are decorated. These decorations are actually down. That's me on the right, holding an apple, too. Um, the, uh, Decorations change all the time. The new ones are, are even more sort of outlandish. Um, being on a creative floor, all the artwork that's on the walls either comes from people who are at the very top of the industry uh, that, the, that he took with his computer can. Um, it was taken from a half a mile away of the city of San Diego, and every window that's facing the bay, the direction he is in, you can zoom into. So uh, it's most that's mostly hotels that are sitting there. So every hotel window, you can make out the art in all the windows in all the hotels in the city of San Diego. And of course, if you're in one of those hotels, you're overlooking the bay, right? So there's nothing between you and the ocean. So you figure, well, I'm safe, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so again, really, really fascinating technology. But one of those things where you have to sort of question uh, what, you know, here's, here's the full image. So it's a big one. Uh, we can zoom in and see what's happening down here on the beach. The beach is my lover, that's probably the only new beach in whatever city this is. <laughs> is it the same crew that did the ET Terra Lynn? Or is it a different? Uh, it's probably a similar idea. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly the same. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant one too. There's lots and lots of detail there. Lots of windows to look at. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, fascinating stuff, I think. Uh, and then connectivity. So, Obviously, we live in a, a world now where everything's connected, right? You all have devices in your pockets that have high bandwidth. Uh, the internet's getting faster, more capable, uh, more stuff is being shared, and all that sort of stuff. 
And then the question comes up about how is this stuff being good to use? Is it being used for good, for bad, for both, by good guys or bad guys? Um, and so that's, that's where my career at Adobe pretty much changed, thinking about, about this. So about uh, almost 10 years ago now, I got invited to a, a law enforcement conference. Uh, just as a Photoshop engineer, they wanted me to attend. And this particular conference was uh, the Internet Crimes Against Children Conference, uh, which took place right there in Silicon Valley. And it's all about essentially uh, child exploitation and missing children. And uh, that conference, and particularly one session at the conference on missing kids, pretty much changed my life and changed the entire direction of my career. So I was saying as an engineer, it was, it's one of my proudest uh, moments to basically have worked on Photoshop software. Um, but I hope that the point of my career is the stuff that I'm working on now. And I hope that everything essentially was, was essentially leading up to this. And so what is this sort of all about? So the, the idea here is that um, uh, basically, Oftentimes when uh, children are being exploited, pictures get taken. And those pictures don't always have a, uh, they have clues about where the potential location of that child might be. And that's what law enforcement needs. So I, I told you about how, on the one hand, way back in the beginning of my career, I walked, was laying on police cars. And now, uh, the, whole perfect, the whole reason I'm here now is because I basically work with the police all the time. I mean, all the time. Uh, my phone is on 24-7. They can call me from anywhere in the world. I'll usually pick up the phone depending on where I'm at. Um, I'm actually on my way from here to, uh, to uh, well, this particular trip. I, I'm here for a couple days and then I go to Dublin, then I go to London, then to Lyon for uh, working with Interpol, to London to work with the uh, UK police, to, uh, to uh, The Hague to work with Europol, and then back to the States and then up to Canada to work with the Canadian police, down to Florida to teach American police, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's almost always the same thing, teaching them how to use our tools, Adobe products, in ways that you guys here may have never heard of or seen. And uh, that's what I really want to kind of, kind of show you both. Um, so, you're all familiar with Photoshop, uh, obviously. There are a lot of tools in Photoshop. Some of you may have heard of, uh, some of you may, may not have. And my job now at the company is to basically figure out how to use these tools in ways, uh, both as a bad guy and as a good guy. Um, I think it's important that people at, at Adobe and in law enforcement be aware of how bad guys use our software and be aware of, of um, you know, what it is that we're creating, inventing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think it's the, the responsible thing to do. It's not necessarily the most uh, popular thing to be talking about at the company would be the guy who's talking about all this, the bad stuff that gets done with our software, but a lot of good stuff gets done with our software as well. So here's a particular example. So, um, oh, actually, I flipped to a video here. Uh, Isolate vector A6. Rotate. Zoom in. Remove occupant. Frisk. Enhance pants vector D7. Isolate pocket contents. Enhance. 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 Meet me at the strip club tonight. It all goes down. XOXO VB. I wonder who you. So, not real. But that's what we're trying to make happen, right? <laughs> um, so what does it really look like to enhance a file? Uh, so, okay, CSI. Everybody seen CSI here? Who has seen CSI? Excellent. Who thinks CSI is real? <laughs> um, so a lot, of, a lot of the interesting things I, I find about images and about technology is that there are things that you don't necessarily uh, realize are, are there in terms of the capabilities. So we showed you that whole big old panel of the city. Uh, this is a picture that a friend of mine took of a squirrel. And um, uh, all I want to do, the thing that I find interesting about this photo is that there's a lot more detail here than you might think. 
Uh, particularly, there's information about the person and the circumstances who took the, the, the photograph. So, does anybody have any guesses about where there might be yes? Yes, to the eye. Yes, the eye. <laughs> to the eye. Uh, so, we've got this picture. And deep down in the, in the squirrel's eye, uh, it's not quite as visible on the screen up here, but basically I can see that there's uh, some grass, there's a white sedan here. Uh, I can tell from the location of this little uh, marker here that it's probably a Dodge. And uh, there's a fence, and then we, you know, we've, we've got our photographer who's holding some kind of a camera bag or some kind of a bag. Uh, so, interesting information. Um, might, maybe useful, maybe not. Uh, here's another example. So, um, in this particular case, so how many people have used perspective crop? Anyone? Right. But, so, basically the perspective crop tool allows you to take an area of a photograph and um, define it as being a rectangle. Right, so this is a rectangle, I want you to crop this image. Now there are some interesting, sort of not obvious ways to use this tool. Um, and the first one here, I'll give you an example, is this door frame. So if we take this door and I use the perspective crop on it. Uh, basically what I've done is I've laid out a grid and I'm telling Photoshop that this door frame, I want it to be an actual rectangle. When we accept this, uh, it flips the door as if it was straight on. Right, so it's kind of like the photo was taken and I was standing in front of it. Um, if I flip this image over, if I remember how to flip this image over, um, and now I'm looking at it as if the things that are reflected in the glass are the right way forward, right? So the reflection and everything else that is in the glass is uh, reversed. And now I can zoom up into this image. And if you can see it up there, there is a van off in the distance there. Oh, you can't see it at all. Uh, and there's a phone number on the side of this van. Uh, so it's 303 uh, 5535. So this is an interesting clue, right? This is a, a clue that could potentially be used to determine the location of a photo. Where was it taken? Uh, maybe a clue about when was it taken, you know, a clock tower or something along those lines. But what if we were to take that to an even further extreme? So this particular photo um, is a, a photo I took for demonstration purposes. Um, and I've resed it up using something that we added in Photoshop CC, uh, which increases the resolution on images. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to get a plate off of the front of this vehicle. So in order to get the license plate off of this, I'm going to use that same crop tool. So <laughs> I'm going to do this. How many people? So of course you know I can do this, right? I'm going to do a demo on my face, but <laughs> I was going to say, how many of you think I can't do this? Um, so, uh, so, so there's my plate. So I've done a rough selection around the plate, and I should get a pretty good result to start. And that's pretty good. Uh, so if I go to the uh, image menu and I change my canvas size, and we go wider by. 600 pixels. Let's duplicate. Let's duplicate first. Same size. I did not realize until just this moment how blurry my vision is right after that long flight. <laughs> and let's see if we can zoom in here. So that's an okay result. Could do a little bit better than that. Actually, actually, could do much better than that. So, 
this is a basic idea. So we've got 7L0516 as the plate that we see. <laughs> How can I uh, teach folks in law enforcement to uh, pull images out of, uh, uh, pull details out of images along those lines? Um, so the end result for me is is basically helping to rescue kids. So um, you know one of the things I, I, I should say is you know how I didn't quite finish the story about how I got into this thing. So I got invited to this conference and um, went to the session. Then I got asked uh, if I would be interested in visiting some place called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in DC. And um, this place, all they do is missing kid reports, and they do uh, Amber Alerts, which is a system we have in the States to let people know when kids go missing. So if a kid goes missing, uh, all the highway signs in, in, in a state or an area will change to, for information about the, the location of those kids. You know, look out for this particular vehicle with this particular plate. Um, the uh, age progressions. So when a kid goes missing for a, period, a particular period of time, they use Photoshop to age those kids every couple of years, so that we have a current photo of what they look like. Um, you know, based on, on what we think the kid can work uh, will look like at age. And the people who do this work do phenomenal, phenomenal stuff in Photoshop. So I've seen them take a kid who went missing as a toddler and age them to you know 20 years old and then look exactly like they looked when they were rescued at 20. In fact, they have a number of cases where basically as an adult, somebody who is abducted, usually when you get abducted, it's by a parent. So there's a split, and one parent who doesn't have custody will take the kid and go someplace else and disappear and create a whole new life. And so um, we've had, they've had a couple of cases where people have you know, just gone past the, the, photo, the uh, missing kids website and seen a picture of, of themselves on the site at you know, 20 years old, 30 years old, and be, and be like, that, you know, that's me, and then call in and then discover that, oh, you know, the story that I've been told my whole life was not reality. Like, my, I was taken from my parents, so it's a, it's a really amazing work that's done in the software. And I'm extraordinarily proud to see the people who, who use the software and the stuff that they use for it. Um, NICMEC, this place that I, I visited, we get at, at Adobe a sabbatical every five years. And um, basically that's, it, at this point it works out to about, uh, it starts at three weeks, so three weeks paid, and then you can use your vacation on top of that. Um, every five years you get an extra week, so this, I haven't taken my third sabbatical yet, but I'll get six weeks of paid vacation um, to go and do whatever I want. And most people go to Hawaii or whatever. In my case, I've been taking them at, uh, at Nixon and just learning about the problems that they have, learning about the issues that they have, and then trying to figure out how can I develop a tool that will help them to accomplish their goals and help them bring kids back. And I guess the, 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 the thing about um, the group that's here in this room is that it, I don't know if you're all uh, headed down the same uh, multimedia track, but, uh, and if you're all uh, taking on sort of those, that creative interest. But you, you guys are uh, presented with an, an interesting opportunity, I think, right? To shape um, information, to shape the way that people perceive things, uh, to use your skills, the skills that you learn in places like here, um, to, to educate, to empower people, to do uh, really amazing things that we couldn't have, uh, have imagined before. When I was a kid, uh, even if the, you know, Photoshop and, and the like existed, there would be no way for me to get that message out to the world. But you guys have that ability. I mean, my, my daughter just published her first YouTube video, which was for a, a class assignment. And um, you know, I, my, my, my poor daughter, because of the stuff that I do with law enforcement, kind of has a, a, very, a rather sheltered life. Um, and you know, like, oh no, I've seen bad things happen there, so you're not going on Facebook or whatever that to be. Um, but, uh, but that power that you guys have, this whole, this generation has the ability to reach a worldwide um, stage from your laptop. And you probably have way better creative skills than I have in terms of being able to, to uh, generate materials that are going to be compelling and interesting and educational. And so what I'm hoping is that, um, I, I'm hoping that in the future I'll see works that come from, from each of you that are, are having some kind of a positive impact 
in the world, whatever it is that you find that um, compels you, right? I mean, I, for me, never anticipated that my job was going to wind up being all around working with law enforcement, around missing children, around some of the terrible problems that I work around. Um, but, uh, you know, I couldn't be happier and luckier and feel like I'm luckier. I feel like I have the best job at the company. Um, and I should say, this is a weird job. I mean, my job, um, I don't make any money. Some would argue, some would argue I spend more money for the company than I make, right, in, in all this travel. Um, I, um, I work in this, I work in the sales department, quote unquote sales department now, because they have the money to travel and engineer, engineering has no money to travel. So as an engineer, you can't travel, except for your conference once or twice. Well, I pretty much live on the road as, as I described. And so uh, the person who is in charge of all of, of sales at Adobe basically has said, look, anything that you need to go out there and make a difference to help, you do, I'll pay for it. And so that's what, that's what he does. And whether it's standing here in front of this class or whether it's um, working with Interpol or some doing a training at, a, at some law enforcement agency in, in Arizona or Florida or whatever it happens to be, um, I feel fortunate that the company stands behind this particular work. And it's not just Adobe. There are other companies that have similar thoughts about this particular problem that we face about being responsible in the world for the technologies. Facebook does a lot of work behind the scenes. Twitter is starting to do more work behind the scenes on this stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, Google is another one that, that uh, actually has, has done a lot of work uh, in this particular space. So, uh, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a bunch of messages here, but one of them is that uh, even if you think you've got a direction, of, uh, you uh, have settled on where you're going to go, you never know what's going to kind of pop up and surprise you, whether it's, you know, switching to be a DJ, whether it's switching to, um, to do military work, or whether it's, you know, changing the job that you have at a particular company into something completely different. Um, I'm kind of simplifying how, how much work was involved in convincing Adobe to make it my full-time job. It was a lot of work, and it required a lot of support from a lot of folks. Um, but again, I couldn't be prouder of the company in terms of, of making this work uh, an, an important piece of work and thinking about the problems that are associated with, uh, with these kinds of issues. Um, I know I've been talking for a little while, so are there, does anybody have any questions out of curiosity? I said, I said at the get go, if you ever have a question, just ask. No questions. Yes. I was just curious, you mentioned that once the technology gets out there, you don't really have control over yeah. you know, what the good guys or bad guys can do. Like in like recent events, are you convinced that law enforcement is always the good guys? Uh, I mean, catching, you know, rescuing and uh, kidnapped kids is a no brainer. Right. I mean, the same technology might help, you know, catch gays in Saudi Arabia or something. Yeah. You know, to me, you wouldn't go there and help them. Well, so that, that, no, that is a fantastic question. Um, and, and it's really the challenge, right? I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that I like to talk about unintended consequences, right? So, um, the, you know, a technology, a, um, a tool can be twisted in a lot of different ways. Um, absolutely am concerned about, about privacy, for example. You know, what does it mean to create a camera that can zoom into every window. I mean, it's really cool that you're archiving a city. I mean, if you think about New York, New York doesn't look like New York used to look. So it would be very cool to have, you know, high resolution photos of this. In fact, it was, it was in some ways 9-11, which uh, helped inspire uh, the guy who created that gigapixel camera to, to create it because he wanted to archive a lot of things that he thought might change. One of the things that he archived right before Katrina was uh, New Orleans. And he took all these photos of that, and of course it looks nothing like what it looked before he took the photos. He went back and took after photos uh, for comparison. Um, the New York skyline, you know, monuments and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but again, sure, it brings into question uh, you know, privacy. It, and it goes both ways. I get challenged to like, uh, on the law enforcement side. So I live in a, in a weird gray space, right? So sometimes in the industry side of things, the industry folks look at me like, oh, you work with a man. 
right? You work for the government, you know, you, you can't, you know, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes the law enforcement guys are like, yeah, well, you guys are just industry. You know, you guys, you know, you won't have to subpoena you for information, I'm not gonna blah, 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 whatever it happens to be. And, you know, I think that the picture is somewhere, I feel like I try to live in, in the middle of those, of those things and, and be more responsible. I don't, you know, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to, to that other than to think about it. I'm not